Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I'm honored to be speaking to a legendary composer who's composed for many video games. Uh, the ones that you might know are Call of Duty, Mass Effect, Myst, but there are many. He's also done television and film. Jack Wall, how are you doing? Good. Good. How you good. doing, Reese? Good, good. Thanks, Thanks so for much for coming. Me on. Uh, yeah. One good. of the things I want, wanted to know was uh, your process in terms of how you compose. Has it changed much since your initial days to now? Or is your process still largely the same, even with all the technology that's changed? I'm, sp I, I'm, I'm sure you've got like a bigger studio now, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My studio is pretty nice. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, everything is always kind of, you know, evolving as 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 you go. Um, I have, you know, a lot nicer equipment than I did 25 years ago when I started. So. That's nice. Got a nice desk. It <laughs> a makes nice, a difference. Uh, studio. Yeah, it, it does. It, it's um, you know I compose in surround now um, because it, I find find it more inspiring. Even though I may not end up in surround, I like to I like to uh, have the five speakers around me and the sub and all that kind of stuff. So that it just sounds better. Sounds like I'm more surrounded by the music when I'm playing it, so I'm more inspired. Um, I think though, generally speaking, um, I try to shake up my process here and there. Like right now I'm writing, I'm, I'm stuck in Portugal because of COVID. So I'm, I'm writing just with piano and I'm finding that to be so, so much more musical than I usually <laughs> write, but I'm writing a big orchestral piece that it, you know, lends itself well to being very musical. So, you know, as long as I'm being musical, writing with a piano is really quite nice to do um, because, it, you know, I'm actually paying attention to that sort of thing um, more than I am the sounds of what I'm playing, right? Mm. So, um, you know, if I'm doing something like uh, sci-fi or, um, you know, something more textural you know i'm going to go for i'm going to look for the right sounds right and i'll get inspired by the sounds and i'll just go down that rabbit hole but if i'm doing something more musical i might want to just start with you know i don't really do pencil and paper it, i find it too limiting too too slow but um i think writing with piano is a nice way to to be about as musical as you can be um so, you know, it just depends what I'm writing, um, you know, what my process is. But uh, a lot of times, you know, I mean, I start out, I, I use Cubase. So um, I start out with, you know, like a thousand tracks all disabled and, and I just look for stuff. And, oh, really? Oh, so that's the yeah. process. Uh, yeah. How do you find Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm always putting new stuff in, in the template and it just starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So... You know, and then I get rid of stuff too because I'm like I'll never use that. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's a do, fun you ever, do you that way. do you ever just jam on the keyboard? Is that your process? Do you hum something in your head? Like, how do you well, come up I'm with all the different a, ideas? I'm more of a guitar player, so uh, I might do that. But yeah, I mean, my jam really is my iPhone voice memo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go, I'll just go for a walk and I'll start hearing something in my head and then I'll just start singing into the phone, you know? And, and then what I'll do is I'll just, I'll take it off the phone and put it right in my session. And then I'll, you know, just so I can remember what I was thinking. Nice. Cause usually my, my, my first idea is my best idea. It, it just, it's, it's not a brag or anything. It's just, um, I, I tend to get worse the more I try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if it works, it doesn't matter, right? As, as long as the, right, um, yeah. the outcome I mean, is the, the I, same. I started, I started getting into television about uh, 2013. And uh, I just remember uh, just like, you know, when you have to write 35, 40 minutes of music in a week, uh, which is like five, six minutes a day, you know, you gotta, you gotta really, you know, trust your gut you know you just gotta get it done hmm. and and i i find that you know as long as i you know if i see the picture and inspired by what i'm looking at i can just write pretty quickly and uh and then when you get into games it's a much different process because 
you know, you're looking at, uh, you're reading scripts and you're reading, you know, what it's going to be later. And then you'll get a, a video playthrough that's a, a video capture of somebody playing through a, a level. And so you have to treat it like almost like you're scoring film, you know? So I'll take a little more time to, to do that, um, just to plan it out and then do it and then write it as if it were a film with all the, like each, each level is like a three act play. You know, you want it to be, you know, depending where the peaks and valleys are, you want to make sure that you, you hit those peaks and valleys when you're writing for, for the, for the experience, mm. whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mass Effect, for example, is kind of like an interactive movie. So, it was. Yeah. 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 Very cinematic. Yeah. And we tried really hard, especially with Mass Effect 2, you know, Mass Effect 1 was back early and, and, you know, we, there was, there was not a lot, like I had nothing to do with the implementation of the score, but Mass Effect 2, you know, one of the things we talked about at the end of Mass Effect 1 was, you know, I'd like to give it a shot to, to put the music in the game myself, you know, make it more immersive and make it more what I'm kind of envisioning for the, for how it, it, it will make the experience immersive. So um, my assistant and I, put everything in the game ourselves and that was you know that's a technical hurdle that you got to jump through but you know we we made it happen and it's not perfect but it's i think it's a better implementation of mass effect one hmm. so you know sometimes it's like you know i almost look at game music as half of it is how good the score is and half of it is how well it's implemented you know you can have a really good score implemented poorly you know that's that's a fact. So you got to pay attention to that. Well, that is frustrating though, because you wouldn't get much oversight in regards to how it's implemented necessarily, would you? Like you'd score um, it and then would the game director probably decide how it's implemented? So have you ever done a game where well, they've implemented the, the score they, they and could, you're they like, they did it wrong? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. That's, that's what happened in Mass Effect 1. <laughs> not, not that it was wrong. It was just that it wasn't my intention. Or what the music should do you know right. i would get certain themes would play when i didn't want them to play and and that was just done it's, it's a little bit of a game of telephone i mean you know making games is rocket science i mean it's really hard to make a game mm -hmm. so the people on you know up in edmonton who are you know try they're doing everything they can to to make the game great and you know the more i can take off their plate the better it is for them because they're they're busy doing a million other things right so um they might get the music and decide oh well let's put this thing this is this says it's this person's theme so let's put it when that person is on screen but really what's happening on screen is you've got this conversation going with them and it's kind of a tense moment it's not their theme playing you know it could be a version of their theme but it needs to be it's all about the vibe of the of that conversation so you want to keep that intact as much as you can and that takes you know that takes the knowledge of why this music was written and to begin with so I, I i felt like i was the right person to implement that and you know that was a long time ago mass effect one so you know you jump to today and you've got teams of people putting music in the game you know it's it's not just the composer it's like there's people dedicated to making sure the music works really well in the game and they know what they're doing you know Right. Um, whereas maybe back in 2006, when we were making Mass Effect 1, it wasn't quite as advanced as it is today, you know, that mm. way. Was there any particular reason why you didn't return for Mass Effect 3 and onwards? Were you just burned out? Were you, do you just want to do something else? No, you know, I had worked, I had worked with Bioware for like five years, and I felt, I just feel like, you know, I was busy with uh, video games live at the time. When I finished Mass Effect 2, it was really hard. I had so much going on. Um, and I, I just felt like our, we weren't as close as we had been working cl as closely. And so, you know, I was really happy with the way Mass Effect 2 came out and, you know, I think they wanted to make a change and I was okay with that. And, you know, this, it was kind of a mutual, mutual thing. You know, it just happens, you, you know, you work on stuff for a while and then you move on to other things. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much how it's. Well, I remember I, it. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I, I, I uh, think of music as like a blank canvas, right? And every time you're making something, you're kind of filling that canvas. So 
as time goes on, I imagine creatively, it becomes harder to try and think of something original. Like you've done four Call of Duties, I think now. Mm. So how... I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So every time you've got to try and think of it, because Call of Duty largely stays the same, right? In terms of the core fundamentals of the game. It, it is... Well, the core fundamentals, but the story is different. Yeah. You know, the story, okay, so, the, so... The environments and... Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, it's like the last one I did was Cold War, came out last November, and uh, that was a vastly different game than the other three. Um, first of all, it had an anchor in the story, which was Cold War. It was the early 80s. Yeah. I grew up in that era. So it was kind of like a very contained score. It was like, you know, I wrote a bunch of themes and they show up all throughout. It's almost like a movie score, you know, that way. Um, whereas other Black Ops games are so varied and the story is really complicated and it's not so contained. It's kind of all over the place. So my score is all over the place, you know, and I kind of like that about it. You know, it's, that's a fun thing to do is it's really varied. It, you know, there's, you're in the desert and you're, you know, with tablas and all kinds of fun percussion and then in, in one level and then in another level, it's all sci-fi and ex exploration and whatever. So it's a completely different kind of, it's almost like several scores in one <laughs> usually, but with Cold War, it was pretty, pretty contained. It was all of a piece really, because it was all about really one thing. Um, so the Cold War was the backdrop as a, as a time, you know, time and era. And then, um, and then, and then you've got like, you know, the story on top of that, which is like, you know, you're chasing a Russian spy. So. Yeah. Did, uh, how hard did you find it with, in regards to deadlines? Do you usually have the same time frame when you're working on a game, like say, I don't know, seven months or something. And then do you, do you still find that's enough time given the time frame you have, or do you, do you like working under deadlines? Or, or do you feel always like, oh man, I wish I had more time? I almost never feel like I wish I had more time. Okay, um, that's a good thing, I think. I like I like having time constraints because then I'll get it done. <laughs> I'm focused and I get it done. Sometimes if it's too open ended, I don't know where to stop at the end of the day. Like I, uh, you know, I like one of the things I like about TV is like, oh, I have to get five minutes done today. If I get five minutes done every day between now and Saturday, you know, starting on Monday, I'll have a full, you know, episode finished. So I get my five minutes done that day. I'm done. I just walk away. Mm. Do you and have a nice, a nice feeling to you... be able to put your work away so that you can be fresh tomorrow. And then there's other times when I'm working on a game where I have tons of time, but I don't, I don't really know how much music I'm writing. I'm just keep writing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do you ever have writer's block though? Do you ever have a, like times where you just, nothing is coming? I, I really don't. You, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like when they send you the visuals and I know what I'm writing for, mm. you plan that out. It's almost like writing an outline for a book. Like a writer wouldn't, sit down and start writing a book, right? It, without understanding where this beginning, middle and end are in this book. Like they know, they, they've written an outline, they get where the story is going or what, what's in each chapter. And then you can start writing because you, you've, you've given yourself a structure. So that's what I do. I create a structure for like a level and then I just, put it up and I get inspired by what I'm looking at and I just write it. And it's, you know, I hear what it's, it's going to sound like. Okay. And, and, I, and I just make it happen. So you've often spoken about live orchestra versus synthetic or orchestra. Like, have I? yeah, you have, <laughs> you've made comments. Okay. About it. <laughs> but okay. because obviously you've, you've done both, you've done both. And you, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you've stated that you prefer live orchestra where possible. Right. Well, you know, I love collaboration. You know, I, I love to, even with other composers, it's just something I enjoy. Mm. Um, 
because they'll come up with new ideas and at the end of the day, it's just going to be better. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry to myself, but you know, if I, if I collaborate with somebody else, we're going to do a better job than if I'd done it on my own. And so, um, I mean, not all the time. Sometimes I, you know, I, I want to keep it to myself and I know what I want. And that happens just as much, but sometimes it's really fun to, to, to do something with another composer, with other musicians, you know, they bring something to it that you wouldn't have thought of. That's all. So when you have live musicians, they're going to play and, you know, they study their instrument for a lifetime and you're gonna put the notes in front of them and they're gonna play it with such emotion and, and intensity that, you know, I can't get with samples, right? So nine times out of 10, I do prefer that, yeah. Mm. But like, you know, I, I just worked with Jimmy Henson on, uh, uh, on, on the uh, multiplayer theme for Cold War and we had a blast just going back for it. It was all electronic, so there's no, no players except for a uh, singer on it. But we, uh, we had so much fun just going back and forth with ideas. And, and that's like, that's the same kind of thing, right? You're just riffing on an idea and suddenly you've got all these other ideas and it's just really fun. So I, I do prefer to work with musicians whenever I can. Yeah. Does the, so say with uh, Call of Duty, for example, or Activision, do they cover the cost of the orchestra? Or is that an additional cost that you uh, work out on your own? Because you know how, like, w obviously you get paid a certain salary, but, like, w when it's quoted, is the orchestra included within that? You're like, hey, we're going to use an orchestra. Uh, typically it's not, um, especially for, for Call of Duty because it's a big budget thing. You, you wouldn't expect a composer necessarily to... I mean, you know, I'll, I, I don't... When I'm when we're talking about a few musicians, I'll, I'll just pay them myself, you know, on a smaller project. Right. But when you got a big project like Call of Duty, they they expect, um, you know, the whole the full treatment to the music, and you know, we produce that, you know, and they they pay for that as a separate budget. Hmm. I've seen I've, yeah. I've seen your books with all the musical notations, you know, so just the books of all the musical notes, oh, yeah. obviously, that you've written. Uh, I imagine yeah. you use a program to do that, right? You wouldn't write it all yourself? Because you know how, say, with uh, Logic, for example, it translates everything yeah. into musical notations. And then what? Would you just print it out? So say if you're um, working with an orchestra... <laughs> that would already be well, worked okay. out. Okay, so yeah. I, have, I have a team of people. When I, when I do orchestral recording, I have a team of people because I'm writing all the time. I, I don't have time to orchestrate it. Yeah, that was, I don't have time thinking. to print out the music myself, you know. So I send MIDI files and my assistant helps me with that. So he, he actually gets everything ready to be orchestrated. My assistant does that. And then the orchestrator and I go back and forth. You know, he'll send me, you know, and usually finale or... Sibelius or one of those programs is yeah. what we use to do the, the score. And then once I approve it, then the copyist takes it and prints all the parts and gets them to the players. Um, it's just at the end of a project, I will typically archive my entire score in, uh, in a book form and I bind it up in leather and I keep it as a keepsake, you know. Fair um, enough. I usually, give, I usually give one to my clients to just so they have it. Yeah, it's oh, just cool. it's just nice to have that, you know. It's it's like I feel like when I look at those years later, it's like oh, wow, it's like I wrote a novel. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, it's and like it's a, kind of a nice thing to have. Yeah, yeah, uh, a nice um, memento, I suppose. I yeah, suppose. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I was I was very fascinated when I found out you used to do civil engineering because it just seems like a completely different field of work compared to what you're doing now when was the moment well, that you decided you know what i'm going to do music i don't want to do civil engineering yeah well i i, I didn't start composing until i was 31 so yeah i was a late bloomer when it comes to composing so had you already um, done music beforehand though? Like, had you studied music? I've been a, I've been a guitar player and then bands all my life, you know, right. before that. Um, and I've always loved music. And 
And actually before, like the eight years prior to becoming a composer, I was a recording engineer and mixer. And it was oh, just, wow. it was before all of that started that I was in, like, I went to school for civil engineering. I have a degree in civil engineering. I don't remember a thing. I swear to God, because it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but it's uh, I, I always loved math and science, and uh, it was just it's just another interest I have, you know. Um, and so going to school for engineering was really challenging and fun, and I enjoyed it, you know, for for uh, civil engineering. Um, I started out in aerospace because I wanted to be, work for NASA. That was the idea. And, wow. Uh, and, but then NASA cut their program right after I started school. They cut their program in like half. So all the schools around the country cut their aerospace programs. In half. So I, I, I moved over to civil engineering because I thought, you know, I'd like to design structures and, you know, bridges and buildings and things like that. So I, I started to study that and, and, and I got the degree. Uh, of course, if I wanted to really advance in that career, I would have had to go get a master's degree. In, structures to be able to really do that but i only spent about a year doing it in the real world it's not as fun and sexy as it is on in, in the books in school you know really? it's so sexy in those textbooks yeah um but yeah i it, it just wasn't as exciting to me to to work in that field it was slow moving and i just one day came in from some like fourth of july vacation or something it was monday morning and I was just like, I think my forehead hit the desk and I was just like, I have to get out of here. You know, I, I just wanted to do something else. And I didn't even know what I was gonna do, but it, um, I became a bartender. And then uh, the band I was in at the time, we, we got some studio time at a, at a recording studio in Philadelphia uh, to record a, some de a demo, a, a couple of songs and um, I just fell in love with the process of recording and I, I really haven't looked back since I've been in music ever since then. Mm. Yeah. How did you, how did you get into that field though? Cause obviously music is quite a competitive field. I mean, it seems like there's a lot more musicians than work. Um, well, yeah, probably, I mean, you, you have to understand back at, you know, we're talking when I started doing that, it was 1988. So, it was kind of a different era of time. You know, mm. there was still big recording studio. I mean, there is now today too, but there was many more of them. Mm. And you could go and get a job at a studio. And so um, as an intern and getting coffee for clients and whatever. So I started in, I was in Boston at the time and I started a place called Synchro Sound Studios. And that studio was built by the cars. Remember the band, The Cars? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was probably a bit before my time, but I am aware of them, yeah. Yes, yes. So um, they had sold it to a couple of guys who were professors over at Berkeley College of Music. So I, I, I learned from those guys how to engineer. So I became the studio manager, started booking my own gigs. <laughs> and uh, before long, I was running the place. For a little while and then uh and then i went to from there i went to new york city um followed followed my friend uh doug DeAngelis, who who was working in boston when we were in boston uh one of the bands we worked with that came in our studio and we recorded at the studio was was nine inch nails so oh, wow. we were we were there recording uh trent reznor's first album Ah. And I was, the, I was the assistant engineer on that album. And I had like a whole a terrible lot of those two songs were done with Flood was producing and he was there. It was crazy. It was just like, we knew that it was a special kind of album because it was just, we'd never heard anything like this before, you know? And then it went off and just became what it is, you know? Um, so there was, there was those types of situations happening in Boston, but really it was, it was a much bigger, I wanted to be a much smaller fish in a much bigger pond. So we, I moved to, to Manhattan and I started working at n a number of studios in Manhattan, it was pl all of which are gone now. Uh, Platinum Island, um, Power Station, 
Sony Music, The Hit Factory. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember some others. There was a bunch of them that I worked at as a freelance engineer. Um, and then I worked at Skyline. That's where I ended up. And that place was where Nile Rogers was in residence for a decade or so, mm. working with every everybody from David Bowie to the B-52s, you know, to Madonna. You know, she was he was doing all that there. So it was like a really great place to be. But it was, it was sort of like right as as Nile was leaving. That's when I showed up. So uh, and then and then the studio business was just going to hell. So uh, it was all, everything was starting to close around 92 or so, 93. And then I, I you know, moved out to LA and was, was wondering, I always wanted to be in LA because that was like more the music I wanted to be around, more like rock and stuff like that. And, you know, I started going around to the studios in LA and it was just, it was even worse in LA. You know, the business was just folding everywhere. So, you know, I would have had to start over and it was at that moment that I decided, you know, we, uh, my wife and I moved out together and she was a, she was also a musician, but she was a game designer and a, and a she was a game designer and a, uh, she had her own band and stuff. So we, one of her friends needed some music for a game. And that's how I got my start in the game industry. Cause I said, okay, this, this studio thing is not going to work out. Engineering is not for me anymore. I was kind of bored with it too. I, I'd worked with John Cale for a number of years um, and I learned a lot from him. And he sort of just kept throwing stuff at me to do. Like it started out, I was just his engineer and then I, be, I started doing arrangements for him and musical production with him. And we were doing traveling all over the world doing stuff together. And um, I just felt like I was ready for something more creative. So becoming a composer was like the next logical step for me. And that's, that's when that happened. Mm. Did you play many video games before you became a composer of video games? Did you know what you were getting yourself into? No, because when I when I um, played video games, I was in the arcades. I mean, I'm 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 a little bit older than you, so oh, of course. <laughs> like, I sort of I sort of missed all the console games, you know, the Sega Genesis and Nintendo, and like I didn't have any of those. You know, I was, I was too busy going to college or whatever. I didn't didn't have any of those things, so. It's not, I didn't grow up with that stuff. I grew up earlier than that. So uh, right around 94, I started playing. Uh, yeah, I got my first Mac, you know, uh, I can't remember what model it was, but uh, it, was a, it was a laptop and I, it came with, you know, Myst, the game, you know, oh, it just yes. came with a little disc. And I started playing the game and I couldn't believe how cool the music was in that it was very atmospheric and immersive and and so uh it was kind of ironic that you know that kind of got me interested in games again you know good pc games more pc and mac kind of thing and then but, five mm. years later i was doing mystery myself because <laughs> <So. laughs> how how long before you became a game composer did you play mist or was it right around the time? It was right around the same time, like maybe within six months of starting playing that game. I was like, have an opportunity to write for a game. Oh, so, right. Okay. So yeah. I, I suppose, yeah, that would have blown your mind because it's changed a lot from the arcades. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, the, the reason being the technology had got, just finally gotten to the point where you could, the CD-ROM was released in '93. That's what mm. that's what changed everything. Uh, you went from having a five five megabyte floppy disk, right? Those big yeah. five inch. One, I remember those. To suddenly you had seven hundred megabytes on a, on a CD-ROM, so you could store all kinds of data, and so uh, you could put music on a disk. Mm. And that's, there... that's what made it possible, really, to go yeah. from bleeps and bloops, you know, the FM synthesis era of gaming to, you know, you could produce real music for a game. And that's right when I came in and I wouldn't have wanted to come in a second earlier because I wasn't interested in the chip tunes at all. Yeah, well, I've, I've spoken to other composers and the, the method that they had to use to compose music just sounds so 
monotonous. Yeah, you're like a programmer. Yeah, you're yeah. a glorified programmer at that point. You're not really a musician. You're yeah, just, you're just writing code. And it was a very special skill. I mean, it was. Yeah, you know, I'm not knocking it, um, but it was. That's what you had to do to get music in a game, and it it just wasn't interesting to me, but it was to others. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you have like a specific uh, soundtrack or a gaming soundtrack that you've written that's you consider your magnum opus, your masterpiece? This uh, is my favorite piece. No. No? <laughs> Straight up. Probably the last thing I write. You know, it's like I really, really feel like I've gotten better all the time, you know? So the last thing I wrote is probably the best thing I've written. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Is there that, any? That's how I feel. I mean, objectively, somebody else could could say it differently, but you know that that's what that's what keeps me doing it is getting better at it. So, at least for me, I'm just I'm I'm, a, I'm in competition with myself, nobody else. You know, I'm not trying to be better than some other composer out there, or just better than myself. That's kind of. I think that's a lot of creative what, people. Yeah. 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 So. Mm. Yeah. Is there any particular um, gaming franchise that you haven't worked on that you'd like to work on? No, no, I'm really happy with my lot. I mean, you know, I, I like telling stories and it doesn't matter what the story is. Um, and I, I still, I'm, I'm still working and still getting opportunities to, to do that. So I just look at every game that I work on as like a gift, you know, I'm grateful for it. Like, you know, mm. I don't like I it, it's weird, but I, you know, I just don't have. Oh, I wish I'd written the music from Halo. But it's like, why? Marty wrote that. And it's great. We wouldn't have it if Marty didn't write it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So why would I want to be the one who wrote it? You know? um, I'm proud of the work I've done. Like, you know, the Mass Effect scores are, you know, I'm really proud of those. I'm proud of Mist. I'm proud of all the call of duties and um you know it's it, it's just it's just really i'm proud of all the games you never heard of that i did and <laughs> you know well there's a lot a, I, a, I mean i've seen this the, the cv you know it's it, it goes on for quite a bit you've done quite a bit yeah. of stuff yeah and it's probably not even all on there <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably but i did this game back you know like eight years ago or so called uh lost planet three and the game did no business but the score is really cool. I really was proud of it because we did like um, like this Americana score where um, the main character, Jim, is this guy from, you know, Earth who's out, you know, on this lost planet somewhere. And uh, his jam is like Americana music. So we had a whole soundtrack just for him that was like, you know, slide guitars. And I wrote 12 songs that were like song score, so they weren't like songs. There was no lyrics, but there's there was uh, you know like just all acoustic instruments mostly, you know, with some with some synth stuff too. But it was fun just to go in the studio with guitar, bass, drums, keyboard, whatever, and we did that. So that was really fun. I've heard you're a big fan of John Williams. Well, he's probably the greatest composer of a, uh, living. And, I agree. I, I mean, totally agree. Who isn't a fan of John Wood? I mean, he's so inspirational. You know, it's funny, but I wasn't like, because of my background that we talked about, like I was never planning to be a composer. <laughs> Just wasn't, in the, that was never the plan, you know? So there's a lot of guys who were like, oh, I grew up listening to Star Wars and that's what made me want to be a composer. I learned to really love John Williams way after I started becoming a composer. You know, it was like, oh yeah, I should listen to him. And he's just amazing. Just, so I can't, I was a late bloomer when it came to John Williams, but I love him. Mm. Just, just great. Yeah. Have you mentioned I, him? I, mean, I, I have met him. Yeah. You have met him. Oh, I have, yeah. that would have been amazing. Well, it, it was, it was one, the one time in my life where, I met a, a, somebody famous and I almost got completely tongue tied. You know, oh, it right. was like meeting your, it was just like, 
yeah, that I, I usually am not like that when I meet celebrities. It's like it's no big deal for me. But it, for some about it, it, it was just like, my God, I can't believe I'm talking to John Williams. It was crazy. It was it was at one of his concerts at the Hollywood Bowl. It was backstage. And it was, oh, so you managed to get back backstage and and speak with him? Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel like you psyched yourself out a little bit because you knew you were going to meet him, or did it kind of just happen by chance? I no, I. It, it was in the plan. Um, he's just a gracious guy. You know, he just sits there. I mean, he's 80 years old or whatever he was when I met him. And he, um, he just sits there for hours just meeting people. And he's just the nicest guy, you know, really just some. And his concert was amazing. And you know, I've seen him a few times, but yeah, it's, mm. it's great. Do you have a bit of anonymity still? Like, because obviously I'm sure people know who you are. Can you walk the streets, say, in California and not get stopped? Or do you get stopped now and people say, hey, oh, no, you did the What I love about what I do is no, no one knows who I am. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's great. No, I'm not, I'm not famous. In, uh, you know, I'm famous in a very small niche of people, you know. Hmm. Um, but just on the street nobody knows who i am mm. it's awesome and somebody somebody might say yo you know this jack well he composed for whatever and they're like oh that's so cool wow but they don't know what i look like you know yeah you did mass effect oh my god you know it's like that but they don't know what i look like you know which is wonderful i love that i would hate to be famous <laughs> oh yeah it seems like the worst thing ever you can't oh you know. it seems like yeah you can't go out to dinner you know well, you just get just, stopped all the time too, and you yeah. can't even have a normal conversation with someone because no. they're fanboying over you or something. It's terrible. Yeah, it just yeah, seems weird. No, yeah. I'm really happy. I'm really happy. I really enjoy when people in my industry know who I am. And so when I go to like GDC or, you know, some kind of, it's fun to, to hang out with people there and everyone knows who everyone is there. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of fun. They'll probably so, have a greater appreciation for your work as well. Yeah, I mean, well, we're all in the same business, so it's not like anybody's fanboying over anybody. But yeah, um, that's right. Uh, it's just nice to be known in my in my industry and respected the way I respect others in my industry. You know? it's mm. Do you do you chase much work, or do you just get the offers? So, like, you'll get a call saying, "Hey, would you like to compose for this?" Or is there specific yeah, I, projects that you kind of chase? It's it's really odd. And I can't explain this, but my career is just steady. It just keeps going. It doesn't like go this way and it doesn't go this way. Like I, I always have as much work as I want. I don't chase work. It comes to me, but it's not like the phone's ringing off the hook. It's not. It's just weird. This Providence thing where I'll finish a gig and I'll have a little time off and I'll enjoy life. And then something else will come up. And I'll do it. Um, this has probably been the weirdest time because we t I left LA just not knowing if I'd ever want to even write again because I was oh. just pretty burnt out. And I do get burnt out, but um, I was really tired and I just wanted to stop for a while. So we left the country and then we got stuck outside the country. And now I'm writing on my laptop and working with my assistant to make everything work. And, uh, and and so uh, you know I'm back at it, and I'm happy to be working again. But it's you know I'm, it's pretty it's pretty it works out pretty well for me. Well, you're probably in one of the best industries, given the times, because you're not required to be in large groups, right? You can kind of just have your own space and compose, really. So you yeah, well, can kind of that, still do your also, work. It's also that we're, we're not doing live action. It's animation, right? So video games didn't really stop being produced, whereas film and television did. Yeah. Right? And all of that's going to really pick up in the, probably over the summer, and it's going to get very, very busy again. So you said that you get uh, burned out. So what's your way of recharging when you get burned out? Like I like to travel. 
Right. Okay. I like to travel. I like to, to do other things. Um, I like to play golf. I like to go outside. I like to be outside a lot. Hmm. Um, pretty active. Um, yeah. Just hang out with friends if, if, if possible. Yeah. <laughs> right now it's <laughs> not so possible, but go out yeah. to dinner, you know, just, just hang out with people that I care about. Yeah. I imagine you've done quite a, a fair amount of extensive travel in your, in your time though, given the work and the industry Ton you work it. in. Yeah. Well, also I, I started video games live back in 2002 and then from 2005 to 2010, I was on tour all the time, all over the world. 26 countries, 155 shows. I was a conductor, music producer. And Doesn't that get tiring with the, the jet lag and oh, yeah. the different time differences? That was murder. But it was great. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was so fun. Yeah. How do you, how do you adjust? How do you adjust when you're, you're constantly changing um, time zones? You find, you find, you find a way. Of, Energy you drinks? Know, cheating, <laughs> cheating the clock. <laughs> yeah. yeah do you do you get uh royalties for your soundtracks yeah a little bit some somewhat not a lot but some right do they get, so would you get like a check every like three months or something i suppose yeah usually every quarter there's something coming in but yeah. it, not every game pays royalties um you know certain companies like ea uh understand the music business and so they take full advantage of uh publishing and and all that for the writers and for them as a company so the, the you know the guy who runs music for ea is came from the record business so he understands all of that really well and he's created a situation where anybody who writes for ea you know uh, will get royalties on their soundtracks because they exploit all that stuff and you know some of that music, some of that catalog gets licensed into film and television and commercials and stuff too. Like mm. I remember years ago, like some of my music for Mass Effect was was in the Olympics. You know. What so, was it? Really? Yeah, it just it was just played during like a commercial for the Olympics. It was like an Olympics commercial, you know. Did you know it was going to be on a commercial or did you just kind no, of No, no, they don't tell out. us. I just, somebody just called me and said, oh, your music's playing on, on the Olympics. I'm like, okay, cool. So I found it. And of course, you know, I, I did make some money on that, but, you know, uh, just stuff like that, that happens all the time now. It's not like really unusual that that happens. Yeah, Mass Effect of all, of all games though. But that, that's still... That's yeah. something to tick off the list, I guess. Yeah, Maybe it's a company called Extreme, Extreme Music, and they they have uh, first dibs on all of EA's catalogs. So they pick the ones they like, they pick the cues they like, and then they exploit them. Ah, right. That's how it works. Hmm. Music business, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. different revenue streams. It's nice to have that. Well, yeah, I suppose if, if you don't have anything on, then it's not like you have to worry completely about money if you know you're getting royalty checks. Whether they're small or big, I suppose it's something, right? It's something, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's much larger for television. I work in TV too, so the royalties from that are pretty substantial at times. Yeah, I imagine. Do you try when to... You're getting better, you know, they are getting better. Yeah, well, I mean, not just graphically, but also story-wise, and I suppose, do you have more freedom now, as the years go by, in terms of what you can do and what you're allowed to do? You mean musically? for? Yeah, in terms of for, well, for for games, I suppose. For writing, you mean? Yeah, yeah, writing, composing. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I've always felt like uh, I've always had freedom. Um, you know, games are pretty free. It's not like, um, there's been a couple times where I didn't have that and those projects really didn't work out for me, um, where somebody had it in their head that they wanted a certain sound, you know, or there's a committee of people that are all telling you different things about what they want. Yeah. Well... I, had, I had this one situation, I won't say what the game was, but this one situation where somebody said, 
yeah, I want, we want something that's like John Williams. Then another person said Bernard Herman. And then another person said like, you know, Hans Zimmer. And it was like, okay, there's three completely different composers doing completely different types of music. Which one do you want me to do? <laughs> and so I think at the time I was, I was trying to keep everyone, make everyone happy and it was just a mess. So <laughs> I ended up bowing out of that one. Uh, that happens once in a while, but most of the time it's pretty, you know, they're hiring me to do, you know, what I do. So. Well, yeah, because I've heard that there are certain individuals, whether it's the game director or someone related to that, that has an idea. They think they're a better musician or they know how to compose something better than the person that they've hired to do it. So they'll tell um, you how, how... I suppose that can happen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I would Maybe imagine... like composers. Yeah, like if you're, if you're being hired, you're being hired because you will know what's best for the game, right? And then maybe they'll make some suggestions or something, but to completely tell you, well, you need here, to do my, this. Here's, here's my thought on all that. I feel like if I'm being hired, it's not necessarily just because of me. I'm being hired because I work well with other people and I have a reputation for doing that. So I want to sit down and get in your head about what you're looking for if you're hiring me. So I want to know what you want. Um, and once I kind of get an idea and most of the time people are like, okay, yeah, we really kind of like this, this, and this, these references, but Jack, just do your thing, you know, cause we don't necessarily want that, but we like that, you know, but we like you too. So you do your thing and I'm sure we'll like it, you know, kind of thing. Or, yeah. but that still gives me an idea of what they're looking for tonality, tone wise, timbre, whatever. Uh, instrumentation, style, you know. Mm. So I will I will go down a certain pathway based on those conversations. And I feel like I'm trying to realize their vision for what the game should be, not necessarily what my vision is. But then at the end of the day, I have to make those decisions myself. Yeah. Is there any uh, genre of music you haven't really dabbled in that you'd like to? Um, I've done a lot of different types of music. Yeah, I know you have. That's why I'm asking. I, I you know, I'm sure there's something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been in the game for so long now. Like, I, yeah. Yeah, longer than most. Um, and I'm still working. Uh, I, I feel like, um, you know, I, if somebody came to me and said, do this really weird thing, I'm sure that I would take that as a challenge and just make that happen, you know, whatever that weird thing was. I mean, you know, I've done so many different kinds of music. Um, you know, I've done big band, I've done really quirky stuff. I've done, you know, lots of action music i've done lots of ethnic music and lots of yeah I, I just enjoy all of it so well your portfolio is so diverse and that's probably one of the things i greatly admire about you because you know how there's some people that can kind of just get stuck in their into their signature sound mm -hmm. you know what i mean being known as that guy so to speak yeah uh, but yeah. you can it seems like you can do everything really uh, I can do a lot. And part of it is that I know who to find to help me collaborate with all that, you know, um, finding great musicians, finding, you know, like if I'm not, like I consider myself, like I can write electronic music, but I keep, uh, I keep going back to Jimmy Henson to collaborate with on the multiplayer themes for Call of Duty because it's been successful almost every time and it's always fun working with him. So, you know, that's, I'm not afraid to collaborate. Mm. You know, if I don't know exactly what I'm doing, I'll figure it out that way, you know? And, and that's always a learning process. I think it was even John Williams who said, you know, don't be afraid to take 
a, take a job where you've never written that kind of music before because at the end of that job, you will have written that kind of music. Good advice. That's why he's John Williams. That's why he's John Williams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you want to work on a, a big film, a blockbuster? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, obviously in California, right? I, I imagine everything. It's all about who you know, and I'm sure you've met with so many different people over the years that you must know some people that could probably pull a couple strings if you wanted to do a particular project. Well, it's it's really not as easy as you might think to get a job as a movie composer. Um, movies are. To, for many composers, the Holy Grail, right? Like mm. that is what they want to do. And they want to work on big films because film is what changed their lives and made the biggest impact on them. So it's very competitive. Um, I'm not as passionate about film as most of those guys are because I enjoy writing music for anything. And if it's that difficult to get in, I'm not going to spend my time doing that. You know, it, I've, it's, I've done films and I really enjoy doing films. They're fun to do because they're contained and they're a two hour experience. And, you know, you, you get to, you know, really affect how that film works, you know, a lot. And it's really fun to do it, but, um, and I'll do more of them, I'm sure. Mm. Because I I think with film and even with television, right, they bring you in quite close to the end. Like if if you're doing the composing for that, that's towards the end of the the production cycle, right? How is it with yeah, games? Well, tele television television is like a being right in front of a um, bulldozer, um, right? Where um, it is just going at a certain speed and it's never going to stop. It's not too fast and it's not too slow. It's just coming at you. Hmm. And if you don't stay ahead of it, it'll just run you over. Um, and film is like six weeks of hell because you, you know, you got six to eight weeks to write this entire score and produce it and get it done. And, has, and you get a million notes to do from the director and the director's really, it's his film, her film. So you got to get it the way they want it. And it's, tough to do that um all the time uh in games you have tons of time and but it's making games is hard so <laughs> everything has its challenges you know well because gaming uh well games can change quite a lot right from their initial inception to the end product because they're constantly changing things even if you have the notes right as time goes on like do you ever see yeah, like a video they, they wouldn't necessarily they won't necessarily usually change the music they'll just change how it gets implemented uh in that case but i've had a situation where my entire score is thrown away because they wanted to redo the game oh my um, gosh so I what did you do with the score yeah it was i threw it away <laughs> um <laughs> it was a long time ago that that happened but it, they they just they wanted I was doing more interactive music, you know, so it was very technical mm. and there's, there's not, they just said, we like what you're doing, but we want something more free flowing, more like a movie score. Can you rewrite the score? I was like, yes, okay, I can. Yeah. It's like one, one of my first games. So. Oh, okay. Well, Hey, I know you've uh, got to get going. So um, I'll wrap up here. If anyone wants to follow you, I mean, are you on social media much? Probably not too busy making music. Um, I, I'm on once in a while, you know, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. occasionally Instagram, not much, but yeah, I'm, I'm there sometimes. Not a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose all your soundtracks are on Spotify, YouTube. Correct. All that jazz. Yeah. Yeah. And you, my website is jackwall.net and it's got links to everything. I got a whole online music, all my online music demo there and I've got links to soundtracks on spotify yeah yeah it's all there cool all right well i'll post everything okay. there thank you so much awesome. for doing this thanks uh, chris yeah yeah i very much appreciate it hopefully uh you get back to uh california at some point safe and sound yep I'm <laughs> and sure everything just goes back to normal for you you're in yeah. your studio you're not working off a yeah. laptop and keyboard <laughs> that's right
Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Uh, support Jack and uh, stay safe. See you later. Thanks. Cool.